And we're back now on the roundtable. Pierre Thomas joining us uh, as well. Thanks for that great interview. But I want to start with Congressman Allison right here. You heard Ray Kelly's argument right there. Stop and frisk is working. It's saving lives. Well, I don't necessarily agree it's because of stop and frisk. I mean, we have demographic changes that would account for crime reduction. The reality is, is that Police need the goodwill of the citizens in order to be more effective in law enforcement. And if this program is breeding resentment and distrust, it hurts the goal of law enforcement. And so I hope, I hope he, despite what he might say to the public, digs in and figures out, is this thing really helping? Could we do better? Can we fit more with the Fourth Amendment and the requirements of the Constitution? And I, I don't think it's smart for him to ignore. Even before said. this ruling, Bill Chris, so the police department had cut back, had cut way back on stop and frisk. Which worries me. In 1990, there were 2,200 2, murders in New York. Last year, there were 414. We're not talking about a trivial accomplishment. The Giuliani Bloomberg accomplishment of cutting crime, radically cutting crime, way beyond what anyone thought was possible in New York has made possible the economic revitalization of New York and an awful lot of other good things, as well as saving a lot of lives. And it's typical of liberal judges, if I might say, and liberal policymakers that they go after the most, one of the most successful policies actually in place in a real city in tough circumstances, one of the most successful organizations, the NYPD, the New York Police Department, and they cavalierly decide well, we can do away with this now. Any place for the White House to weigh in on this debate? Probably. I mean, I think this is an issue for New York City. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Eric, Eric Holder talked about some sentencing things, which I think we'll get to. But uh, obviously, the, the officials here, uh, most importantly, the police, deserve great credit for the reduction in crime. A judge has spoken, so there are going to have to be some adjustments. I think there is a question how much of the reduction is due to stop and frisk versus some of the other great techniques that they've employed here. Uh, but clearly, there's going to have to be some adjustments going forward, given the judge's ruling. You know, I, this is an example to me of sometimes I think our debate is actually overpolarized. I think there is truth on both sides. On the one hand, the program is working, and on the other hand, there's no question that there's abuse, and there's no question that resentment is being bred. I don't happen to agree with the judge's ruling that it's unconstitutional, but I do agree that there ought to be some introspection and examination about how do we apply this well, program in a way that's point. more community friendly. And what she's friendly. called for isn't all that um, you know, intrusive necessarily. And a monitor, some more training. Yes, the camera's in some limited precincts. I do want to go to the point you brought up, David, this point about mandatory minimums. Big announcement from the Attorney General this week saying that he wanted to find a way to have fewer prosecutions that would lead to mandatory minimum sentences for drug crimes. Because they oftentimes generate unfairly long sentences, they breed disrespect for the system. When applied indiscriminately, they do not serve public safety. They have had a destabilizing effect on particularly particular communities, largely poor and of color and applied inappropriately, they are ultimately counterproductive. And you pointed out, Pierre Thomas, you were there at the speech, that we've had such a, a huge overcrowding in our prisons, largely because of nonviolent drug offenders. There has been an 800% increase in the number of people in prison since 1980. And the attorney general says that is not sustainable. $80 billion a year it costs. And one of the things he said you must look at is fairness in the system. Uh, one of the, the facts he pointed out that really struck me is that African-American males will spend 20 percent longer in jail on a sentence compared to their white counterparts convicted of the same crime. Uh, he said that needs to be fixed. Uh, the other issue he wanted to look at was nonviolent offenders, that there are way too many people spending way too long in prison on charges that, you know, are mandatory minimums when they could be put in for lesser time. And Keith Ellison, another one of these issues where Republicans and Democrats coming together, again, Rand Paul, uh, one of the chief Republicans saying, you know, the attorney general is basically right. Well, you know what? Uh, last term, we reduced that 100 to 1 crack cocaine disparity down to 18 to 1. That's a progress. Republicans are part of it. Democrats are part of it. There's room to improve here. Mandatory minimums basically deprive judges of the discretion to sentence the individual defender. I was a criminal defense lawyer for 16 years, and I can tell you that mandatory minimums do not advance justice. We need to let the judge figure out what kind of sentence is appropriate in this particular case. Common ground? Mandatory minimums exist as a result of a law passed by Congress. True. The Attorney General thinks they should be changed. He should. He has a big staff there at the Justice Department. In the old days, if a, someone in the executive branch thought there should be a new law, they would submit legislation. They don't just give a speech. I agree. There may well be support. Maybe there should be support in Congress for altering or changing the mandatory minimums, which only apply to Why federal crimes. But where is the legislation? 
Well, I think I think folks in Congress are going to work on this. Yeah. I also think you see governors, uh, conservative governors like Rick Perry, experimenting in terms of uh, reductions of sentences. And I, I, so I do think this is one of the areas where you do see maybe not universal, but broad bipartisan consensus. But Rick Perry got it. the actual Texas state legislature to change certain laws. It would be well, nice if the Obama administration ever actually well, submitted a legislative we're proposal. I, I, we're doing it. They're working on it? Okay. I think good. There, is, yeah, yeah. there is bipartisan support. My question is this. I think we can all agree Attorney General Holder made a speech that most people would agree with. The question is, where has he been all this time? He's about out the door. If this is such an important issue on which there is bipartisan support, why didn't he do it earlier? And my problem with this administration, honestly, is there's a lot of talk, a lot of speeches, and not a lot of action. I wish we had but time on the other to debate hand, all this. Yeah. We don't have any more time. Thank you all very much for a very spirited discussion. Thank you, we'll be right back.